Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Cynthia Tomain here with Interactive Brokers, and thank you for joining us this afternoon as we take a look at trading gold futures using the language of price to guide those decisions. Now, with us today, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to have Timothy Morge of Blackthorn Capital and Market Geometry. He's actually going to be delivering uh, the presentation. But before we get started, I do want to um, pass the ball over. Let's first actually put this on uh, the CME slides, and I'm going to pass the ball to Barbara and ask her to give us a quick overview of the products that um, we are going to be discussing today. So here's the ball, Barbara. Would you get us started? Thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. I would love to. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. My name is Barbara Schmidt bailey with CME Group, and we are very pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with Interactive Brokers. I'm also particularly pleased to be able to welcome you to this presentation with trader and educator Tim Morge, How to Trade Gold Futures Using Price to Guide Your Decision. As a trader and investor, you look for opportunity in the markets and a way to capture and profit from that opportunity. Futures are an extremely flexible tool for expressing your market opinion and capturing that opportunity. Furthermore, futures have distinct advantages over off-exchange markets such as CFDs, potentially even those such as ETFs and stocks. CME Group Futures Markets consist of contracts trading on the CBOT, CME, NYMEX, and COMEX exchanges, trade electronically almost 24 hours a day, providing traders an opportunity to trade market volatility any time of the day from anywhere in the world. Futures prices are a result of supply and demand for the underlying commodity, for example, for gold, silver, crude oil, corn. On the other hand, mining stocks, petroleum companies, and the ETFs that are made up of these companies all have additional variables affecting their stock price and therefore distort the pure price of the underlying commodity. Futures prices are determined by the instantaneous equilibrium between supply and demand among competing buy and sell orders on the exchange at the time of the purchase or sale of the contract and are therefore widely viewed as the most accurate and transparent prices available for a commodity. Market participants have equal access to prices and the um, depth of market of the futures market uh, via CME Group's Globec electronic platform and the Interactive Brokers Trader Workstation. And CME Group is part of a regulated industry under the U.S. CFTC and NFA. Because model markets are highly responsive to overarching global economic and geopolitical influences, they present a unique risk management tool for commercial and institutional users, as well as a unique, exciting, and potentially rewarding opportunity for individual traders who seek to profit by correctly anticipating price changes. The best place to execute against those opportunities is via CME Group's COMEX Metals Markets. COMEX Metals Markets offer the flexibility of various contract sizes, which in turn means you can access markets best suited to your desired level of exposure. These metal markets provide unique trading and hedging opportunities, and with an average daily volume of approximately 400,000 futures and options contracts traded, our metals markets are the most liquid in the world. COMEX Gold Futures products consist of three contracts, sized flexibly at 10, 50, and 100-ounce contracts. The 100-ounce contract, ticker symbol GC, is the best known, uh, most liquid contract that uh, we offer. The newest contract launched just over a year ago is the E-Micro Gold. It's a 10 ounce contract, ticker MGC, so it's one tenth the size of the 100 ounce GC futures contract, uh, requiring only one tenth the initial margin requirement and with reduced trading fees. The Micro Gold contract is fungible with the GC contract in a 10 to one ratio and it can also be accumulated towards a 100 ounce gold bar warehouse receipt if you are interested in actually taking delivery. The micro gold contract averaged approximately 5,000 contracts a day in November, making it a viable contract for traders looking to average in or, in or out of positions or perhaps take a smaller exposure in the gold market uh, if you're a swinger position trader and are looking to actually hold a position overnight and the margin is too big for the 100 ounce. Uh, contract, this is certainly a great alternative. In addition to gold futures, CME also lists gold futures options on the GC with short-term and monthly expirations. Uh, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the salient features of the three futures contracts in our gold complex. 
just note the various um, tick sizes and uh, details of settlement type um, that uh, you just want to make sure that you are fully aware of it always before trading a contract. At this point, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Tim Morge. Tim has been a professional trader, author, educator, and mentor for more than 35 years. Besides trading his own capital, Tim is president of Blackthorn Capital, a private money management firm that works with several of the largest non-U.S. institutional portfolios. In the 1980s and 90s, Tim managed and taught other traders for institutions like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs and remains one of the world's largest currency traders, routinely carrying positions of several billion U.S. dollars. These days, you can find Tim online via his website, marketgeometry.com, or in a classroom, sometimes at university, otherwise the local grade school, all spending his time to teach traders. So in this webinar, we will, Tim will be teaching you the basics of his core trading methodology using the COMEX Gold Futures. Thanks again for joining us, and thanks so much, Tim, for uh, donating your time for today's event. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, for having me. Uh, oh, there's, unfortunately, that's me. Um, thank you all for taking the time. I know you guys are all busy, especially now that it's uh, the holiday season, of course. Um, Today we're going to talk about trading, and of course the sexiest thing that people want to talk about when we get to talk about trading is entries. We're actually going to talk about what we call the language of price. We will look at some entries. We'll look at some actual trade possibilities and some trades that actually took place. These are all uh, things that we've done live uh, at the uh, Market Geometry website, um, and I've done at some other um, – we're looking at weekly gold, so these are things that we've covered, for example, when the border trade was still around. Um, so we're going to be covering quite a bit of ground, but let's go through the basic introduction that we have to do whenever we do any financial um, presentation. So uh, obviously I'm from Market Geometry. I'm the founder and president there. Um, there's lots of free information there. We'll talk about that later. Risk disclosure, you can read through it, um, or you can look at the slides later on. Cynthia certainly covered it. Um, I boil it down to this. There is no Holy Grail. If you came here today looking for the Holy Grail, I don't have her. I don't think Barbara brought it with her. Um, I don't think it exists other than hard work, hard work, hard work. Um, a lot of people come to trading thinking that it's easy pickings, and it's not. You know, people will go uh, to school to become a doctor, and they'll get four years of education, and then on top of that, they'll get their medical education, and then they'll go do their fellowship, and then eventually they'll have. I don't know how many years, and they'll get out of school when they're 30. But they'll come to trading, and they'll think that after three or four months that they're, uh, they're at university level. It doesn't work that way. It's a process. So what I would say to you is remember that this is always a process. That you need to educate yourself well. You need to always use stop losses. This is my experience. Your experience may vary. Never take anyone's word, including me, for anything when it comes to your own money unless you can verify it yourself. Past performance is very important. Past performance does not guarantee your future results. There's all kinds of people that flash out stuff, but you have no idea how they put that stuff together. So take a look at what they're showing, what they're teaching. I teach fifth graders. I teach over 12,000 fifth graders this year um, how to trade um, in a program in 39 states. I teach professional traders how to get better. I teach other hedge fund managers, and then I treat I treat, uh, trade uh, my own money as well as four sovereign wealth uh, funds. And then I teach uh, retail and, and medium-sized traders as well. So I have pretty, pretty busy days. But the one thread that runs through all of this is I always tell people, you have to put in the work. Nobody can give it to you. I don't believe in chat rooms. I, I believe in you learning how to trade. So let's take a look. Um, there we go. I want to dedicate this uh, webcast to my first two uh, mentors, Dr. Alan Andrews. Um, he was a great market researcher, and he applied Newtonian physics in the 1920s and developed the median line, one of the tools we're going to look at today. And it's one of the only leading indicators that there actually is in the market. People can say that they're, they have this indicator or that indicator. There's actually a mathematical relationship that gives a median line instant statistics. There's been three doctoral dissertations 
accepted and published on media lines. Um, I've done research for more than 30 years on it. Um, and of course, Dr. Andrews at MIT spent four years with a whole group of graduate students locked in a room with, with uh, yellow pads and pencils, developing the median line as well as action reaction lines. And so we'll talk about those. And then one person that doesn't get much press, and I've decided to reach back and give him the credit that, that he is due, is um, in my formative years, uh, I was offered uh, the ability to go to Princeton which is right next to Commodities Corporation. And I spent uh, three summers, um, a good three parts of my summers going to Princeton. Um, and they were trying to lure me there as an undergraduate. And uh, I would literally ride my bike over to Commodities Corporation. And the one person that stepped up and helped me was a gentleman by the name of Amos Hostetter. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, he is, or he was, he passed away unfortunately in the late 70s. Um, really the best campaign trader, meaning long-term portfolio trader, uh, and I, I do a lot of historical studies. There's been no one like him in the last three, 300 years. He's the very best. Unfortunately, he has very little written material. Um, so those of us that were fortunate enough to, to learn under Amos, um, there, there was no better teacher. And I'm going to try and uh, do my best, as I did with Dr. Andrews when I first started teaching. There was very little out about Dr. Andrews. And now, of course, there's lots of pitchfork tools all over the place. I'm going to try and repopulate Amos's work as well. So hopefully today will help a little bit on that. So, so we're, here's what we're going to do. We're going to understand the language of price, and to do that, we're going to do a study of the weekly COMEX Gold Futures contract. Now, I know most of you probably do not trade weeklies. I trade dailies, weeklies, and monthlies, as well as intraday trade. But one reason you would look at weeklies is there are fewer pivots, there's less noise, it's a great place for you a playground, if you will, or if you're, if you're a coder, a sand lot, for you to go ahead and take a look at pivot formation, formation of patterns, take a look at whatever indicator or tool that you use. For example, let's say you use market profile. Uh, you might want to take a look at market profile on the weekly. Um, the lack of these huge, these huge um, amounts of noise on the E-mini S&P, for example, using two-minute E-mini S&P makes it very difficult for you to practice. So I like to take a look sometimes uh, with groups at longer-term things. And I'm, there's going to be some long-term trades that I take on this. And I often have trades that go two and three years. And I'm not suggesting that there are that many of you that do. But these same patterns, the same things that we're going to look at, work on any time frame. You'll see them in five-minute E-mini S&Ps or 1,300 tick uh, bond futures. Uh, pick your poison. Anything that fluctuates, we'll see these on. So don't worry that it's on weekly gold and it doesn't pertain to you. It pertains to everybody, everything. So let's take a look. We always start with a blank chart. Now, Barbara says um, that the micro averages, oh, four to 5,000 contracts a day. And a lot of you are probably saying, well, that's pretty thin to me. Or if you put up the MCG contract and charted it, it doesn't look as pretty as this. Well, on the weekly it might, but certainly on the intraday it may not look as pretty as the GC contract. But that being said, there's nothing to keep you from charting the big contract. This is the GC contract, which is $1,000 per dollar, okay? And then executing on the MCG, which is one-tenth that. So if your portfolio or your, the balance in your account doesn't allow you to trade, long-term trade the gold contract, the large gold contract. You could all, always trade the MCG, but just chart it off the big contract. So if we look at this chart, it's a blank chart. I've got nothing on it. This is always how we start every day, whether it's a market geometry or when I get up in the morning at 6 o'clock and start to go through the markets that I'm looking at that day. Even if I'm intraday trading, I start with a blank chart, absolutely nothing on it. I start over every single day. I recommend you do the same, and the reason why is, as you do some simple things, and let's just move through some simple things. Okay, here you can see, all I've done is I've drawn a line through the center of the action. Nothing special. Anybody can do that. I'm not trying to grab bottoms. I'm not trying to grab tops. I did put a fancy little 
arrow on the top, but it's a simple line of force. It's a vector, if you know much about physics, but it's a line of force that shows you where price is headed. And, and in this case, if you just have a blank chart and you draw this simple line of force, it's pretty easy to say at this moment, gold's heading higher. Yes, it's had some pullbacks here and there, but overall, gold is trending higher. Simple. So that's the first thing I do. I draw in a simple line of force and take a look and see what we get. Then I drill down some more. What else can I draw? I erase the line of force. Okay, here's the same chart. Now I'm going to get a little more specific. Let me grab a tool here. And you'll note here in this area, price zoomed up or bubbled up, as my partner Shane would call it. And as we come to extremes, what does price tend to do? It tends to pull back. And what we have after the pullback is a nice, sustainable set of higher highs and higher lows. Higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. These are very sustainable. This can go on, as long as it's in this fashion, this can go on and on and on. It's not going to burn. It's like when you drive down the, the uh, highway. You know, in Arizona, the, the uh, where I live, now the um, speed limit is 75 miles an hour in lots of places. Now, if you drive at 75 miles an hour, which means you, most people are driving 90, um, you're going to burn gas very quickly. If you're driving 55, like you are down here, you're going to get much better gas mileage. But when price ignites, and let's call this area right here, this is going to be a new term, and hang on one second, let me just show you. Look at this thing go vertical. And this bar right here, and I'll mark that as well. Mark doing a lot of marking here. That bar right there, we're going to call that the point of ignition. Now, why do we call it the point of ignition? Well, we had these flat tops running all the way along. And we were making higher highs and higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. Let me get my cursor back. There we go. Higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. But we're leaving these flat tops. And this box right here encircles a bar where price just zoomed out. You might call this the point of ignition. It's certainly the beginning of the wave. But I certainly like this bar, this zoom bar that went through the tops. Anywhere in here is the point of ignition. And what happens? Then we go vertical. We start to burn gas very quickly. And so when we're burning energy that fast, and I think about the markets, Dr. Andrews taught me this, think about the markets in terms of energy because he was a, like I am, uh, had, had a degree into physics. He was a thermodynamics professor. If you think about the market in terms of physics, um, it's much easier to understand rates of change, lines of force, how things move. So we're going to talk about that a lot today. So here we are. We're zooming higher in a vertical fashion. And any time you see things move in a vertical fashion, you know that they're burning up their fuel quite quickly. Now, that does not mean that you should be picking tops or looking for it to top out. Let price tell you when it's had enough because you don't know where this fuel is going to end. This fuel, because you don't know how much is in the tank. There is, unfortunately, there is no way, I don't care what anybody tells you, anywhere, anyhow, there's no way to measure how much energy price has accumulated in this area. And this is price accumulating energy, then it blasts off. But somewhere up in here, and it's always a little bit farther than you think, that's, the, that's my gauge, it will run out of energy if it's running vertical. But if you happen to have caught it and got long in the back of your mind, when price goes vertical, instead of doing the happy dance and going, yeah, gold, yeah, gold, go to 1,500, go to 2,000, you should be thinking about, I'm looking for what's the logical pro target, what's the place where I should be taking my profit, those types of things. And we'll, that's a big part of what we're going to talk about. That's one of the things that Amos instilled in us over and over and over. So here's our same price. Here's our point of ignition right here. Let me mark it in for you. And you can see price at that point went vertical. And it went a little bit further. And then we got a wide range bar that closed on its low. We came down. What do we do? We tested. This is a high. 
This is a low. To my fifth grader students, we call this a mountain. Price came back down and filled on this multi-pivot line. We draw it across after you get just a couple touches. In, in normal trading language, it's a simple trend line. Price, it tends to come down and fill a mountain. And if you have a, nice, a decent stop, there isn't one here, but we'll show you one later on. You have a decent stop, it's not a bad place to grab on and see what you can get out of it. That's very simply what we teach them, mountains and valleys. Now, price comes up, and you can see it doesn't make a new high. And one way to think about this, let me get my line, there we go. Each wave that the market spawns is spawned with a purpose. And in this case, this wave, when it comes down, my pointer again, when it comes up, makes a new high, now it comes down and tests and holds at this multi-pivot line. Its job is to make a new high. That's its job in life. That's what it was spawned for. Unfortunately, it didn't. It left a lower high. That's, a, that's your first clue. It should make you sit up and go, well, that's interesting, especially as it sells off. And then when this bar zooms through the mountain that had already been tested, so this multi-pivot line, you should be sitting up and saying, hmm, what actually do I think about this market now? Is it over? Now, for those of you who are typing in questions, in general, I'm just going to keep going and I'll answer them um, at the end. Uh, I can't read and think at the same time. I, I, I can barely chew gum and swallow at the same time. So, so we have a, what, what's called a swing failure here because price should have taken out this prior high. Instead, we took out what was support. So what's my question to you? Let's take a look. Let's just mark the swings. And I'll do this a lot of times as well as I'm, as I'm getting ready to trade or getting ready to mark up a chart. I'll just mark the major swings. Let's mark them in. So here's our swing up to a high, a pullback. I don't want to mark in every single one. Then I have a big long run up to the major high. I've got a pullback to test this multi-pivot line. I come up and make a swing. It's not a swing high. So here's our swing failure. And now we're at this point. Now here's my question to everybody. You don't have to type it in. You can type it in. It doesn't matter. It's up to you. Is the trend right down here up or down now? Are we in an uptrend or a downtrend? So I've got some ups. I've got some downs. Short term down. Okay. Depends on the time frame. Okay. Well, we're trading weekly. Here's the way to think about it. We're trading a, a weekly gold chart here, so the time frame is weekly. So in this time frame, we want to know, is it up or down? So let's just make it easier. Let's take all the noise out of here. I took all the bars out. Now we have the swings. Here's our, I'm going to mark in potential buyers and potential sellers. Here we've got the major high. Here we come back and retest the multi-pivot line. We come back up and leave a new high, but it's lower than the prior high. We're just going to connect this line. I call these Dumbo lines just because they're simple trend lines. It's not yet a multi-pivot line. It's, at the moment, it's a simple trend line. But there'll be potential sellers in this area probably. We know there was a huge multi-pivot line here. Let's go back and look at it. And it's also the point of ignition. So the larger players, we call those whales. And in a lot of markets, I'm one of the whales. Whales are the largest three or four traders that are holding the greatest position and or have the ability to move the largest amount through a market and influence, if you will, where that market is likely to accelerate, stop, turn. They'll work a market over a lot of times to get their positions filled. Sometimes it's a lot of work. You'll have to sell to buy several times. So here 
we've gone through the first multi-pivot line. The question is, are the whales going to show up down here at the point of ignition? The point of ignition is just below this multi-pivot line. We have one multi-pivot line broken. I would call this a swing low. My rule of thumb is we need to break two swings. Now remember, as we look at this presentation, we're going to be looking from 2005 through 2011. There probably isn't, there probably are at least 100 trades on these charts. And we're not trying to pick out a specific trade. We'll show some entries, but a lot of it will depend on how you frame your trade. We'll talk about that in a second. Somebody asked a question about volume. I don't care about volume. It's meaningless to me. And the reason why is because, no offense, Barbara, volume is not reported very well, It's re even, even at the end of the day. Um, there's so, there's so many ways to hide what you're doing. There's so many ways to do exchange for physicals. There's so many ways to park positions elsewhere that it, it's, it's a meaningless statistic as far as I'm concerned. So I don't, I don't even bother. Other people do, that's fine. So here's our question. We know there'll be some potential, potential sellers here. My suggestion to you is these, these will be more medium size and or retail sellers. There may be sellers again here at this multi-pivot line from the downside as we come back up. We're going to find out whether or not the whales or the big boys are sitting down around this area at this multi-pivot line and or right above the point of ignition. So let's put the bars back in and take off the swings now that we talked about that. And by the way, let me go back. I would suggest on a weekly basis until we take this area out, we're still in an uptrend. You're going to have to find out whether the whales are going to step up. If the whales pull, if we go through this area and the whales don't step up, we're in a downtrend. But until we get through this area, this is the last stand. This is the key area. So let, now let's take a look. And what I've done for you here is marked in what I think are key areas. Now, if you look, we don't have many swings before we get into the vertical portion. So we're going to use our widest swing, which is right here. So let me type. We're going to use this as our A point, our B point, and our C point. That's already up there. Beautiful. And one way to think about this is Median lines are always drawn with alternating pivots. It always takes an A, a B, and a C. They have to alternate. And generally, let me see if I can draw this freehand. If you start out with a high, you're going to end up with a downsloping median line. It's not the worst median lines I've ever drawn. High, low, high. So we chose a high, low, high. What do we choose? We chose the widest swing in this run up. Then price went relatively flat. Then we went vertical. And we chose the highest high. No mystery here. Let's see what we get. Rather than a down sloping median line, same thing high, low, high. Even though we were looking for a downsloping median line in the sense that 90% of the time, if you use a high, low, high set of pivots, you'll get a downsloping median line. This trend is so strong that it gives us an upsloping median line. And that should warn us right there that this is a very strong uptrend. So I, as you're drawing along, and you know, at this point I'm not ready to trade, I'm still marking things up. As I draw this, now my eyes, obviously, I've drawn so many median lines, I can see them without drawing them, obviously, but I still draw them in, of course. And as I draw it in, I, the first thing, there's something magical about it. It goes right up your arm into your brain. You draw it in, even though it's on the computer, and you go, um, wow. Alternating pivots from a high, yet I still get an upsloping median line. That tells me this is a very strong trend line. Am I sure I want to sell this? Where would the next buyers be? Where would I be if I was buying? Well, I'd be near this point of ignition. The point of ignition is right down in here. 
This is my multi-pivot line. This is the area that's important to me. In fact, I'm looking over here. I'm going to skip. I'm going to out myself. I'm going to just mark this in advance. This is an energy point, and maybe that'll come into play. So that's in the back of my mind as I'm drawing along, and that's what you should be thinking as well. Now, this is a very wide median line, this blue one. Let's go back and look. Very wide. So you can draw in a downsloper. You can use the C pivot, something like that. What would that look like? Here you go. All I've done is the C pivot, the test of this upsloping median line, which also happens to be the bottom of this particular wave. Then we pull back, and this is that the top of that swing failure. Now we're headed back lower, so I'm going to use the top of that swing failure. So there's my three pivots right there. Now you can see I used a high, a low, and a high, and it does indeed generate a downsloping median line or pitchfork. Now as I draw it, remember earlier on I kind of gave myself away and I marked out a energy point. Here's an even better reason why I would like this area, because now I have lines of opposing force. What does that mean? I know that the that median lines in general have a mathematical probability. The probability is that price, when price is heading toward the median line, it'll make it there 80% of the time. There's been, as I said, there's been three doctoral dissertations written about this, as well as all the research I've done. And Dr. Andrews did tons of research. Some very talented people have done lots of um, research on this particular matter, and it holds up any instrument, any time frame. In fact, things like unemployment reports, um, housing, weather, you, you choose it. If you can, if it fluctuates and you can chart it, these statistics hold up. So as I look at this, I see price coming down. We've already made, it's already done its job. In this case, we've already come down to the median line here. And we've already zoomed the blue median line. So if it's coming through the blue median line and it zoomed it, with 80% probability, it's going to make the lower parallel of this blue median line. That's what statistics tell us. So I take a look at it, and I say, well, I've got this multi-pivot line going. It's also right above the point of ignition, which is extremely point important to me. That's where price went vertical, right here. And I drew it over, forward in space, and I see that all three of them come together right here. This is an important area. It's called an energy point, and energy points often act as an attractant for price. Now, if you look at the image, it might be a bit messy. So once again, let's just clean the chess pieces off the table and see if we can see the chess game in our mind. How about that? These are the swings. I've left in the median lines. Here's the blue upsloping median line. Here's the price swings in green. Here's the downsloping red median line. And here's my question. If price gets to the energy point right here, let me give a big fat circle or a big fat square on it. If we get there, has any real damage been done to the uptrend at this point on a weekly? And we'll do a pivot count in a little bit. Some, somebody's asked me about a pivot count. <coughs> the answer, to, for me at least, is, again, until we have price action below not only this lower blue parallel, but also this multi-pivot line, we haven't done any damage to the downside at all. And as a whale, a large trader in this market, this is where I would be putting my money if I wanted to get long right here, especially because of this energy point. Now, I'm lucky. I have median lines to use. A lot of traders don't have that 
but they can draw the multi-pivot line, the simple trend line. Let's put the let's put the bars back on. There you go. Let's see what price did. Price came down, floated around with the middle. The problem with these smaller median lines is they get sloppy because they're very narrow, and especially this one is sloped rather steeply. So it's very difficult for price to stay within them because it has a tendency to keep drifting to the right, which is space or time. But in this case, you can see we came down, made two attempts to try and hold below the median line, then came back to the upper parallel, had a lot of trouble at this blue up sloping median line. And you might not be able to tell, but you know, when you review the slides, and the slides will be available afterwards, there's never a close outside of this red down sloping upper parallel. Even though we've we keep busting through it and trying to push, we keep closing right back underneath it. And eventually it gives up. And what does it do? It heads down. And as the statistics say, price coming from the upper parallel, the upper red parallel, and breaking lows should make it to the median line 80% of the time. And sure enough, it does. Price coming from the blue upsloping median line and heading lower and breaking lows should make it to the lower parallel. Well, now we're at the lower parallel. So take a look at this for a second and ask yourself a question. Here's my question. If price came back into this area, now it's traded up a little bit, would you be willing to get long with the stop underneath this small poke? That's what you need to be asking yourself. Okay? And I'm going to tell you, at the energy point, is going to be one of the best trades on this chart and one we did live. But let's take a look. Came down right at the multi pivot line, right at the red down sloping media line, right at the blue upper parallel or lower parallel. If you had your order in, you got filled. If you didn't have your order sitting there, it didn't get filled. So often, you, you need to do your homework and have your order in and your stops at the same time. And you can see price just screamed out of the hole. And even better, although if you were long, you might be taking profits at this prior high, you might be taking profits at this median line, you might be taking profits at this prior, prior high, or you might be trying to shoot all the way for this upper parallel. The move above this swing and this swing, to me, tells me that if you thought you were back in an uptrend, it reconfirms, if you, sorry, if you thought you were in a downtrend by taking out some of these swings, and I don't because we didn't take out this major multi-pivot line, when we take out these two prior swing highs right here, it reconfirms that you're in the uptrend and on the way back up. And at that point, if you're not long, you should be looking for a long. There's lots of people typing questions, and believe me, if you just relax and let it slide right over your head, they're all going to get answered. They're all in the presentation. There hasn't been one that's been asked that isn't coming to you, so just relax. So here we are. Price came down tested the multi-pivot line. Now it's headed higher, taken out this swing high, this swing high. Now it's taken out the major prior swing high. And take a look at this. Let me mark it with a box. Area here and this area here. Let me get my cursor back so Cynthia's happy. There we go. This is a point of ignition. Take a look at the bars. We had accumulation, small range, and then a blast off. What do we have here? Accumulation, and then a blast off. And the blast off zoomed through the major prior swing high. So we're going to keep our eyes on that and think about it 
and wonder to ourselves, is this price igniting again? Because this entire area may have just been, if you think about it this way, price eating up space or as some people would say, eating up time. I like to think of it as price and space. Price and time is equally correct. But price made its vertical move. Now it's got to restore its energy. In fact, it's got to come back down in this sense. It's got to come back down and retest to make sure that there are buyers down here. And there are buyers down here. As I said, my fifth graders would be buying here with a stop underneath never looking back. Where would they take their profit? Right here. And they trade like it's automatic to them and it's magnificent to watch because they don't overthink their trades. They just frame their trades. And we'll talk about framing trades in just a moment. So let's keep our eyes in this area and decide whether or not this is a point of ignition. Now, we have mature market structure. We've got a lot going on here, but we've got mature market structure. Let's see if we can pick out the market structure and draw a median line. What about using the point of ignition? Here's the low before price zoomed up. We can use that as our A pivot. Our B pivot, simple. It's our major prior swing high. And the C pivot is equally simple. It's the retest of the multi-pivot line. It's also the energy point. And of course, then we zoomed off to the t to the races here. So we put in a new median line. Here's what it looks like. Again, it's a bit wide. But there's things we can do. What do I like about it? I really like as I after I've drawn it beautiful touch up here and take a moment and just look at it because I'm going to draw some more and see if you see anything else let me go back and draw something Why not? This is called a sliding parallel. What you would do is grab the same slope. Sorry, I need my pointer. You need to grab the same slope as the lower parallel or the median line and just connect a set of bottoms out in the space. And if you wonder whether or not it's working, look at the tops. They have about the same frequency. So you know that these lines are carrying the same frequency as the median line, and the median line has mathematical statistics behind it, so these sliding parallels work very well as guides for us. Let's see if we can use them. So let's roll our sleeves up a bit. And by that I say, I'm saying, let's take a look at the individual bars. Sometimes we've already talked about using the point of ignition. And we already talked about whether this was a new point of ignition. And take a look at it. Sure looks like a new point of ignition to me now, because look what happened afterwards. It blasted off, blew all the highs out, ran up and touched and surpassed the median line, although it's come back down a little bit. But remember, the old point of ignition was a wonderful area of support. So I'm going to mark that out with a straight line and say, hey, shouldn't this be an area of support, or are we headed down to the lower parallel? Well, the last time we were at the point of ignition, that was the end of the rope. But on top of that, let's take a look. I see in here little tiny pullbacks, A, B, then price comes to a new high. Then we have ignition, and then A, B, C. Well, let 
what if We simply thought about that. Here's our ABC. Here's our ABC. Oh, wait, I need my cursor. Here's my ABC. Here's my ABC. And now, because I'm wondering, is the sliding parallel a good thing? What if I just connect a sliding parallel off the ABCs? And what does it give me? It gives me multiple touches. And for me, the ABCs of the situation, it gives me multiple touches. The ABCs, ABCs, if I connect them, look where they terminate. makes me feel even better about this line. But even if I had drawn this line earlier, which I did a few slides back off of this low, look at these entries right here. How about this as a here's our here's our test. So we've come up, we've drawn here. Now we let price come up and test the line. When it heads back up, I'm saying to myself, boy, I sure would like to be long. How about this as an entry if I'd drawn it in earlier? And I drew it in earlier for you. With a stop below here. Not bad. Line's not straight, but you get the idea. That's my second favorite entry. That's my second favorite entry of the day. This would be, this makes me salivate as a trader, especially as a whale, a large position trader. So, and I'm going to, if I take this trade, I'd be holding this trade for years, literally. And in fact, am. This is a very nice trade. This is a good alternate entry test and retest. My, this is my favorite entry. If you look at all my long-term trades and short-term trades, these tests and retests with, with good money management, we'll talk about money management in a second, are my most frequent entries. And they have a, for me, again, this is me and only me. You know, your results may vary. A winning percentage of about 72% for me. And here you can see I marked in the same little boxes. Here's my ABC and my ABC. Hopefully everybody can see the ABC pullback, the ABC pullback. And now I've drawn in the sliding parallel that I did by hand before. And of course in everybody's mind you should be saying is this C a termination bar and are we headed back higher what should give you the confidence first of all you've got a tested sliding parallel right in front of you look I drew it from this low and this low it was tested here this would have been a beautiful entry so it was tested here and here you should have lots of respect to this line secondly this ABC matches this ABC and third, and equally important, this point of ignition started the move, and when price came back and tested it, it held wonderfully. Here we have a point of ignition. Price is right back in that area. It held magnificently. Is this a place to enter the market? Well, you'll have to go to money management to decide that. So let's take a look. Again, in many ways, today is Amos Hostetter Day for me. And one of the concepts that's out there, but not, not used by many traders, not that popularized, but we're going to be pushing it, I'm going to be pushing it over and over and over, uh, many of his concepts, because these are the little things that will make or break you uh, and turn you into a consistent trader, or if you don't follow them, it's unlikely you'll be a consistent trader. If you can get your risk reward ratio, and we'll talk about how you get how you get that uh, statistic in a second, 
up above three to one, it's magic. And I don't mean it guarantees you're going to be a winner. What I mean is it's much easier. You're not pushing the ball uphill if your risk-reward ratio is three to one or higher on your average trades. So let's take a look. How do you figure it out? Well, first of all, you need to say, where am I going to get long? In this case, we're going to get long at the bottom of this mountain, according to how we teach the fifth graders, which is also at the point of ignition, and it's also at the sliding parallel. That happens to be at 1045. Now, there's two stop losses you can put on this. This is a minor swing. And it also happens to be even better than a minor swing, the bottom of the point of ignition. So it has some real credibility as far as I'm concerned because the point of ignition holds so well, as you see over here. Tight stop loss underneath the point of ignition, $25 a contract. Now, if you're trading big gold, remember, that's a lot of dough. Generous stop loss. Now again, remember you're trading weekly, so so don't think if you're trading 50 minutes of gold, 25 bucks. He's crazy. Remember these are weekly bars. On a 15 minute bar, it will be a much smaller stop. But take a, we want to just take a look at the difference. If I want to go to the second swing back, it's underneath these multiple lows, and these again these are minor swings. It's a 65 dollar stop loss. How do I figure my risk reward? Okay. I need to know and what's my initial profit target? Well, Dr. Alan Andrews tells me that 80% of the time, and the statistics verify this, we're going to go to the median line, which happens to be just about at the prior highs. So for now, in this exercise, I'm going to use my initial target as 12.35. And yes, somebody just asked, "Don't you mean the risk reward is you know you were quoting it backwards?" Yeah, sorry, that's just the way it's quoted. You don't have to like it. You can quote it the other way if you want to, but risk reward is quoted this way in the trading community in general. If you wanted to quote it the other way, go ahead. That's your prerogative. If I risk $25, and I'm going to make the difference between 10.45 and 12.35, my risk reward is 7.6 to 1. In other words, I'm going to make $7.6 for every one I risk. And I know I could say reward risk, but that's just not the way it's said, and it's not the way it's quoted. Now there's $190 on the table, and that sounds like a lot of dollars when you're talking about $1,000 a dollar. $190,000 should make everybody light up. However, if we use the generous stop loss, there's two problems with it. First, it's huge. At $1,000 a dollar, it's $65,000. I don't care what account size you have, lots of money per contract. Worse, if we're going to make $190 and we're risking 65, our risk reward ratio is we're only going to make 2.9 for every one we risk. It's just not good enough to take this trade if that's your stop. And so many times, if that's the only stop you can find that's underneath structure, you can use a cash stop. But the problem with the cash stop is you never know where the orders are. There, there's going to be buy orders down here from whales and other people. There's going to be buy orders down here. But if you put a, a straight cash stop in, meaning not underneath structure, you have no idea. You're just guessing. And there's no way to tell where it's going to stop. If you say it's, you're going to risk $10, it might work, and it might go 11 And so you get stopped out, and then it turns around. So I always try and put my stops underneath structure. And in this case, you can see both of these are under structure, but only one of them would work for me. 2.9 to 1 and risking this amount of money 
It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So I would take this trade, but I wouldn't even contemplate this trade. Now remember, we have to have a profit target to get there, and it has to be realistic. Let's take a look. Now, remember, here's our first potential entry off of a point of ignition. Here's a second potential entry. Here's a third potential entry. And in fact, actually, I showed you one earlier on up in this area. So if, you'll be, if you're just patient, I know you think that price will never give you an opportunity. Look where our initial entry went from the point of ignition, 1045. Without even breathing hard, it got all the way up to 1400 to the median line. So as price, as the median line, which was upsloping, as price went up the upsloping median line, we had the ability to keep moving our profit target higher and higher and higher. And you should. You need to book that extra money. The longer you have your portfolio exposed, the more you need to get paid. So if you're long against upsloping lines, you make more money. So we want to slow down and frame our trades or plan our trades carefully long before we get into the trade. Don't just get long and then say, okay, now where am I going to get out? Instead, you want to have your stop ready and you want to have your profit target ready and you want to do the math and decide whether or not this trade is worth it before you even get interested. And there's another reason, because if you take a look, there's also multiple profit targets. We could have gotten long here. We could have gotten long here. We could have gotten long here at the point of ignition. We could have taken our profit at the top here. It's an energy coil. It's right at the median line. Or run stops underneath prior swings lows. Our next profit could be up here at the median line. Here's a new point of ignition. We could have instead just put our profit, stop profit, underneath this prior swing low, which turns out to be another point of ignition. Then we have another profit target up here at the upper parallel. Or here's a new terminology for you. I measured. I took the sliding parallel, and then I looked at the lower parallel of the median line, which is in blue, and I measured the distance between the two. I took that distance and I put it on top of the upper parallel. This is called undershoot down here. Undershoot gives you overshoot. I mark it out up here, and my question is, does it hold frequency? Certainly. It absolutely does. So this is also a very valid profit target. Could price go higher? Absolutely, yes. It's an upsloping line. You don't want to be taking short positions against an upsloping line anyway. But if you're long and the market is going vertical, you know at some point price is going to run out of energy. Trees do not grow to the sky, as my mom used to say. So this is another valid profit target. So there's lots of profit targets. You have to. Everybody's going to be different. You have to frame out where you want to get in, what your stop is, what you're willing to risk. The risk-reward ratio needs to make sense. And for that to happen, you have to choose what profit target you're going to use. And what it needs to be a realistic profit target. And over time, if you hold on to the position, your profit targets can improve. Let me ask you a question, Cynthia. I'm at an hour. Can I go a little longer? Is that okay? Tim, everyone I uh, 
Steele is very interested in what you're saying. So I do want to um, let you go longer and let those who have joined the event know that you can drop off if you need to, and we'll be sending um, <clears throat> the recording so you'll be able to catch up on what you missed. So, uh, oh, okay, and I got it from Tony, too. Yes, please definitely continue, Tim. Okay, there's a, there's only there's 15 slides, but it's not going to take that long. And there's some interesting uh, – we're going to go over literally the same ground but from a whole completely different standpoint. So I think it will be educational, and I know I went a little long, but, hey, that's the nature of uh, the beast, as they say. Well, definitely. Continue then. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Thanks, Vinny. All right, here we go. So let's look at it again. Let's, again, take the chess pieces, clear the chess board, start all over again. Because some people had some good questions. People were asking about pivot counts. People were asking about sliding parallels and all kinds of other things. Let's look at it again completely different way to look at it. There are so many different tools. They're all very important. They're all very useful. So again, we start with a blank chart. And what are we in? At the moment, we're in an uptrend. Let's just mark out the swing highs and swing lows. This is one of the very first things I do. I'll, I'll, I'll move in and do the line of force like I did. But then I'll go, here's the prior high. Here's a swing high. Here's a swing low. Here's a swing high, here's another swing low. Here's a swing high, here's a swing low. Price comes up, it breaks this swing high. When it breaks a prior swing high, that's a change in behavior because here we made all these new lower swing highs and swing lows without taking any out. Now suddenly we're breaking swing highs. So now we take out a swing high, make a new swing high, leave a swing low. Make a new swing high, leave a swing low. So you can see we were in a downtrend. That's the line of force. Now we're in an uptrend, and you can see the line of force. So we have two trends. You can see the change in behavior right here. Okay? And I'll draw that over and over and over. And it may seem simplistic, but I've been drawing these you know, long before charting programs were available, I draw them on paper. Doesn't matter. Do your homework. Be prepared. The only way you're going to get to be consistently profitable is doing your homework. Well, what did I do? One more time. I simply removed the bars and marked in the swings. Now let's just take a look and see what we did. Here we are in an uptrend in blue. We're making higher highs and higher lows, higher highs and higher lows. We leave a major swing high. We don't know that it's a major swing high yet. Price come down and test a multi-pivot line or a balance line. I've got this in gray because it comes up. It makes a high, but it doesn't take out the prior high. And, of course, when it breaks, this multi-pivot line, which is also the bottom or this lower, this prior swing low, we're now in a downtrend. This is a change of behavior. Now we come up. We leave a new high, but it's, again, a one, two, three. This is the second lower high off the high. We break this low. We make a new low. We don't know that this is a major swing low, but, of course, it becomes a major swing low. We come up. We leave a high. I put this in gray because watch what happens. As we come down, we make a new low, but it's not a lower low than the major swing low. And then the next wave takes out a swing high. What does that mean? That's another change in behavior. So we were in an uptrend. We turned into a downtrend. Now we've confirmed an uptrend again by taking out this prior swing high. Now we come down, leave a higher low, a little inside bar. And again, these are the inside minor swings. They're much less important than these big, fat swings. Price is doing its thing. It's an ABC, if you will. Now we head out, and when we take out this high, this is even further confirmation. And, of course, this would be the point of ignition right here. Look at price expending its energy. Once it expends its energy, it has to have these inside minor swings to restore its energy. Once it's restored its energy, it makes another new high for the move. Minor pullback another new high. So 
by taking the bars off, it's another way to clear the deck and take a look at it. And I appreciate all of you that are taking the time, um, you know, to stay longer. Now, we're just going to add some different signposts. Some of them are the same, some of them are different. These are just some of the tools that I've accumulated and use over the years. First one, here's our, let, let's start out by, in, here's our ABC pullback, see them? We had these in before, and I just marked them so that you can get your focus back and pay attention to the first part. Okay, now I know it connect, how it connects to the first part of the presentation. Now, price comes up. Now let's do a pivot count. There was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Anderson who was the math professor, the head of the mathematics department at MIT when Dr. Andrews was in the thermodynamics department and he was doing his study with uh, graduate students. And Dr. Anderson was also interested in the market and he came up with what was called the loose count and used it as a trend test. And instead of no offense to any of you out that are, you know, Elioticians and, uh, you know, GAN has a way of counting. Everybody has their own way of counting. Dr. Anderson's method was make it as loose as possible. You can count this four or five different ways. doesn't matter as far as he's concerned. And his idea was basically after doing the statistics, you can, you can count it and put rules on it like, you know, it's got to be, you know, 382 widths of the whatever to get to the VC. You can do that type of stuff or you can make it real loose. And he found that making it loose makes it easier to count and it's just as statistically valid. So here we go. This high is P0. We come down and make a low and it's uh, it's an obvious low. That's P1. Now we come up, we make a secondary high, it doesn't take out P0, it's P2. We come down, take out some lows, and we just have minor swings here so we're not going to count them. And we have a wide range bar. We're going to call that P3. We come right back up. Again, wide range bars. Leave a high. Start to head lower. We're going to call that P4. The moment we have P4, we're going to draw in a line, P0 to P4, and project it forward in space. And what Dr. Anderson says is, once you can draw P4, once you can count P4 and draw on the P0, P4 line, you have a trend test barrier. And if price makes significant progress above the trend test barrier, that trend is over. He does not imply, nor does this signify, that we are now in an uptrend. Price has to prove it's in an uptrend, but just merely that this downtrend is over. You can go then and mark when we take out P3, we're making a P5, and of course, whatever the lowest low is, is P5. We make it. I've seen these go in the P35, P37, P45, especially in the grades. These go on and on and on. So don't just think P5 is the end, although a lot of people do think once they find P5 that they're ready to rock. P5 is the minimum acceptable in a trend count. So here, in this one just happened to hit. It's P5. Now, you could count it differently and get to P7 and P9, but counting the big pivots, this is P5. Now we've turned around. We come through the P0, P4 line. That tells us that the downtrend is no longer intact. It does not tell us we started an uptrend. To me, what tells us that we've started an uptrend is we've taken out a swing high because we were making lower highs and lower lows. Now... In fact, we take out two swing highs, which I like even better, and that's my rule of thumb. We take out this swing high and this swing high here. It's a change in behavior. Now we have our small ABC pullback, and look where the C terminates on this. So often, and Andrew says this a lot, this is also a center line. This P0, P4. Not all P0, P4 lines are center lines, but this is a beautiful center line or a multi-pivot line. Look at the touches on it. So often when you bust through it like this or zoom through it, price will come back and retest the area 
and that's often a beautiful opportunity for an entry. Or if you were remiss and didn't put in a stop loss, shame on you, and you were a short, this is your one chance, as a, as, as a trader friend of mine at the CME, Gail, used to say, thank you, Jesus, let me out. So this is generally this retest will happen. Price will zoom through, will get a retest. This is a beautiful area if you have a stop below it that you can accept for an entry. So we have our A by ABC again. Now look at our line of force. Once we retest from the switchback or the other side of this P sub zero, P4, look at the line of force. Point of ignition, we take off, pull back, another point of ignition, take off. Absolutely gorgeous. That's what makes a market map come to life. Some of just the small points, things like marking out the point of ignition, things like doing the small pivot counts. You don't have to do them. I don't count pivots on every chart that I draw, but especially if you're if you're a little slow that day, or if you look at the chart and it doesn't make any sense, by all means, draw on the swings. Maybe do a pivot count. Look for the ABC pullbacks. Look for the P0, P4 line. It, it'll just give you a better feel. Let's take that off. Now, I've left in the swing highs and swing lows. I've left in the ABC pullbacks. And the question is this. If we want to draw a median line, which pivots do we use to draw a median line set from? And if we can draw one, will we be able to use it? Can we read the market? And can we use it to execute the trade? Well, it depends. If you draw it and it's interesting, then we can use it. So the first thing is we pick pivots and draw it. And again, we're going to use the point of ignition. We're going to use a regional high, major high. And then we came right back. Again, this is the fifth grader trading. This is a mountain. Take a look at it. It looks just like a mountain. So I, li I live right over here. If this is Granite Mountain in Prescott, Arizona. Yeah, this is a mountain. Price comes down, tests the bottom of the mountain. Beautiful place to get long. Stop right under the point of ignition. Price takes off. And so you can see this median line. Here's our change of behavior, and it's also a test of the median line. Another test of the median line. This median line has lots going for it. There's lots of things to like about it. So Dr. Andrews stated, and statistics show us, that price reaches the median line 80% of the time. I can't say that often enough. At Market Geometry, we call that Andrews 101. A price has met the median line twice, here and here, and it keeps stair-stepping higher within the median line set. But notice one interesting thing. Even though it's come to the median line twice, it's unable to test the lower parallel. That's a sign of strength. You can't trade low enough to test this lower parallel, at least so far. But there's one puzzling thing that should be in the back of your mind, which is it also hasn't broken above and held above the median line. So am I worried as a trader? It's a valid question. Everybody's going to have a different answer. My answer is going to be, no, it hasn't broken it yet. However, every time it looks like price is about to turn, what happens? We stay in the uptrend. So I'm going to stick with this uptrend until it's no longer an uptrend. And I'm going to let the market tell me that the trend has changed. I'm not going to try and predict. I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to prognosticate. Instead, I'm, if, the, if the market's changed phase state, so to speak, or it's changed trend from upper to lower, we did that exercise a few slides earlier, I'll be able to see it. In this case, I still don't see any change. Now what do I draw? I draw on the sliding parallel. And remember, 
I like that the ABC is connected. But you can see I drew it off of, let me mark where I drew it off. This was my starting point. This was my next line. So I drew it off of though this point and this point. I could have traded here. Stop's too big, by the way. But I like it to test. And you can see it test here. So I like the retest right here. I would love this trade. If I wasn't long here, and I was, because of the point of ignition, this is called trading close to the bone because it's so early in the median line set. But the stop is small. It's right at the point of ignition. For a portfolio trader, it doesn't get any better than this. But if I'm an intraday trader especially, on these sliding parallels, if they've been tested like this, and here's my test. So I drew it here from this point and this point, projected it forward in space. Here's my test right here. This is the retest. This is the place to be on the intraday basis if you find yourself looking for an area. If you can afford the stop, and that'll, you'll have to do the risk-reward calculations, What's your, what's your logical profit target? Well, it's the median line or this prior high. Now here's another possible entry. Right, right at the sliding parallel. What's the problem with this entry? There's no stop. It stops all the way down here. That's lots of do re mi. Could you put a cash stop on it? Yes, but I don't, I don't like them personally. And if you put a cash stop in it, You'd be stopping yourself out at this lower parallel. This might be where price stops because price will often stop at the lower parallel. There's statistics on that. So there's not, I don't like this trade in any way, shape, or form. This is a better trade here, but out of all of them, I like this one the best. Now I'm eyeing up this area. Anybody interested in getting along here? if it comes back to it again? And what would be the problem with getting along there? I'll answer it for you. I'd be interested in getting along there. Somebody says not all markets have such wonderful structure. Well, one reason we went to weeklies is because you'd see this type of structure so much more so it's it's so it's so much more likely to show up on weeklies because there's a lot less noise that's why we're looking at weeklies but once you learn you'll see these on the five minutes you'll see these on 1300 bond ticks you'll see them on range bars etc so um, a good place to practice and certainly a great place to do presentations are on dailies weeklies and monthlies because there's less noise so the question is, as we come down here, do I like this area? Well, I love the frequency of this sliding parallel, and I certainly trust it. I don't like the stop. There's no stop yet. Now, price may build us a stop, depending on how it gets there. But at the moment, just projecting a little circle and saying, if it gets here, do I want to get long? The answer is, well, I have to see how it gets there because I don't have a stop at the moment. And I'm unwilling to place a cash stop. So let's see what happens. Price is in an uptrend. We've got a median line set showing us the probable path of price. That's what median line sets do, good ones. We found a sliding parallel with the frequency of price. And now what's our job as a trader? We're always stalking. If we're in an uptrend, we're always stalking the next long. If we're not already long, where's the next area where I can get long? The answer here is pretty simple. Where price and space or price and time depending on how you want to think about it, time and space are equivalent. Where do they meet? Where do they meet? Well, they meet, again, this is a, a line of balance. You can see price come up to the median line. We should see a pullback now. Where's the logical place for a pullback? Right to the sliding parallel. So we'll mark it out. I don't know if we'll use it, but we'll mark it out and say this is a logical place. I'd love to see price give me a chance to enter here, and hopefully there'll be a stop. At the moment, there's not, but it depends on how it gets there. 
So we'll mark it out as traders. We're making a map. We just continue to evolve our map. Mark it out. Let's see what we get. And you can see, I marked it out, and while price did give us a pullback, it didn't give me a pullback in an area. If it had come back again, I would have been able to put my stop underneath this poke, but it didn't come back into the energy point where price and space met, or price and time. So we pulled back, trended higher, I'm looking for a pullback to buy right in this area where price and space meet, and that would have allowed me to put my stop right underneath here, and it would have been a beautiful entry. But you can see price is so strong, it barely pulls back at all. It's attracted to the energy point, but it shrugs it off and heads back higher. So what does that tell me? Well, that tells me that we are in a very strong uptrend. The uptrend continues. We won't go into this, but this is a form of Hagopian, meaning that it didn't do what it should have done, which means it should move further in the opposite direction. And so I wonder in the back of my mind, as strong as this market is, maybe we'll finally break above the median line for a change instead of spending all our time here between the lower parallel and the median line, and actually between the sliding parallel and the median line for, take a look at this. We spent from 2009 all the way to the middle of 2011 between the sliding parallel and the median line, period. That's pretty incredible. That this, this simple set of lines that we drew so, so early could hold price that long and give us many trading opportunities, by the way, depending on your uh, parameters. And what do we get? Here is our sustainable reality that we just talked about. And remember early on in the presentation, we talked about what's sustainable and what's a blow off where energy gets expended too quickly. Well, this is sustainable. Take a look at it. All the way from 2005, sorry, 2009 through right about here, April of 2011. Then we hit a new point of ignition and blast off. And when we have this vertical move, and look at this move, it's vertical. We have a huge wide range bar. It doesn't tell you the move is over. It tells you if you have profits and you're long, have you carefully considered how are you going to get out of this market? Because when markets go vertical, when they turn, they tend to turn just as fast. We call those chimneys. They go up fast wherever they end up, and they could stop here, it could stop at um, you know, the same distance from the sliding parallel up here, it could go even further. But wherever it turns, it tends to turn and turn down just as fast. So you want to be out before it turns, or you have some type of sliding stop profit order in that protects your profits, because hopefully you'll have lots of money on the table. So when the moves are like this, they can go on and on and on because they're sustainable. When they go vertical, they're not sustainable. They will turn and pull back. That's just the nature of energy. If energy is expended quickly, you run out of energy. That's just the way it is. So what do I do? We did this before. Undershoot, measure the difference between the sliding parallel and the lower parallel, put it on top. Undershoot gives us overshoot. We use the same slope. We add it on top of the upper parallel. Here's our point of ignition again. This was our point of ignition before. This is exactly the same chart. I've just taken some of the other stuff off of it. Here's our wide range bar. Now let's see how that plays out. Price comes up. Where does it stop? 
If you're still long and you know about undershoot and overshoot and you're running stop profit orders on the way up, you want to take your money at the overshoot, period. If it keeps going and somebody else makes money to 3000 God bless them. But at some point, you have to book your piece. you got to put your money in your pocket. Otherwise, you walk away with nothing. Because when this turns around, it often turns around just as fast, and you'll be losing so much of your profits so quickly, you'll, you'll be frozen. That's why we always have stop loss orders in the market and hopefully they turn into break even orders and then turn into stop profit orders always somebody asked what this is this is actually a continual continuous weekly chart so you know continuous so it's a GC pound F and E signal I'll look I'll look at uh, questions in, in a minute we're almost done here's the turnaround we came up to the overshoot. We actually double tapped it. So if you missed it the first time, you could have put, put your order back in because you saw some action below. It should have alerted you. Came right back up and touched it again. You would have gotten out. And then look at it, though, when it falls off. It falls off just as fast, goes just as vertical. Now, here's the question for all of you. Think about this carefully. Here's the point of ignition. Here's our sliding parallel that's held, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six times perhaps. We're coming back down if testing the overshoot area. We're coming through the median line perhaps. We haven't yet, but we might. If we do, are you interested in a long position here? That's what you have to ask yourself as a trader. That's your job. If price gets down to this area, and you know, I haven't checked the price of gold in the last half hour or so, but we're not that far from this area. Do you want to get long? There will be questions. And the, the answer is, yes, you're interested, but it depends on what the structure looks like when it gets down there. Because at the moment, you might not have a stop other than a cash stop. If it, instead we poke through and then come back and then hit the energy point, that'd be, that'd be a different proposition. So it depends on how it gets there. Again, it would also depend on the size of the stop and whether or not that's within your risk tolerance as well as the risk-reward ratio. And again, I never take anything under three. Not, I can't go into it at the moment, it, but you know, you can see, see it at the market geometry site. There's, there's article, free articles there that will give you a good feel for why three is such a magical uh, lower level. Um, two is acceptable, but three is magic. Anybody that thinks they can trade at one-to-one -one or lower, they might as well just give their account to their significant others because then someone will love them when their account's gone. You can't make money long-term statistically if you're trading below one-to-one. -one. It just doesn't happen. It, it looks like you can on a chart, but it just doesn't hold up. So as price gets to this area, your job as a trader, and this is live. This is as of two days ago when I submitted the chart, the, all the charts to Cynthia. This is live. You can, you can in, add the bar down. We're down in this area. We're not quite there. So depending on how it gets over to this area where, time, where price and space meet, are you willing to get long? And that's a question you're going to have to ask yourself when it gets there or if it gets there. There you go. That's the presentation. One of my friends from the uh, Coral Gable group, this year, one, another student of Dr. Andrews, he says, absolutely, take the trade at the slide. I'm with you. If there's a stop, I'm there. I'll say, oh, yeah. So let's take a look um, at questions. And please um, give me time. 
I hope you enjoyed it. Hi, Cynthia. Tim, while you're, um, and I do want to encourage those that have questions, but I uh, want to give time or Tim time to actually review those questions. So okay. while you're taking a look at it, I do have a piece of business that I need to run in every event, and that's a poll. So Tim, go ahead and read those questions. But everyone else, if you would take just a moment, there are three short questions on the polling panel I've just opened up, and if you would please make those selections there. I be management does want to make sure that you're getting information relevant to your trading needs. So if you can fill that poll out, I actually do review it with management on a weekly basis. Now notice, once you make your selections, there's a submit button at the bottom. That will allow me to compile those results. Now there's also an input field in question number two. If you've got some additional comments um, or suggestions for upcoming topics, happy to um, <clears throat> review those as well. But you will Oops, poll just ended. I was going to say you'd have to type quickly, but you can always send those comments or suggestions to me at webinars at interactivebrokers.com. So thanks, everyone. Now, um, in order for you to be able to submit the questions, notice there's a minimize button to the right-hand side of that polling panel that will take it out of your way. So if you would, um, simply minimize that and enter the chat questions. Um, uh, Tim, you can also double-click that chat panel title bar to expand it and view um, all of those questions. So um, back to you, Tim. Oop, I just, I just double-clicked and it disappeared. Ooh. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, <laughs> I got it. I found it. Okay, <laughs> good. I was, oh, my God, I killed it. <laughs> okay, we have some good questions here. Let's see. Um, should we use weekly contracts or continuation charts? Well, first of all, this is weekly continuation, so that answers that question. Um, if you, if you, you need continuous because... You know, if you're going to do something that runs from 2005 to 2011, obviously you need to use all the contracts. So use continuous contracts and use, you know, if you're going to look at weeklies, dailies, monthlies, use continuous. Um, this is a great question from E. I'm just going to say that. Um, does chart time frame even matter? Since we trade price and risk reward, can we just go off entry and pivot numbers generated off of any time frame? chart that shows good geometry. That's exactly right. Here's the way to choose your time frame. When you start to draw, if it looks clunky, you're probably at too long, too short of a time frame. So if you draw, for example, um, 10 tick E-mini S&P charts, you know, it's got little blocks, little bitty blocks up and down. Instead, if you go out to the 20 minute, it flows, it's nice and pretty. So First, find a chart time frame that's nice and pretty. Then you need to find one that fits your schedule. So, for example, if you're a professional, let's say you're a doctor or a dentist, it's pretty hard to trade during the day. So you want to be looking at something like 240 minute minutes per bar or a daily bar and, and, and trade off of that if you're a professional during the day. Or if you're going to intraday trade, trade the night, ses night sessions. And there's lots of things. Obviously, gold, we're talking about today, but you can trade currency, futures. There's all kinds of things that are extremely liquid after your daytime or before your daytime, uh, should I say job, profession, whatever. Um, there's lots of things, depending on where, no matter where you live in the world. The markets are 24 hours, and there's lots of things that trade and are, are liquid 24 hours. So you can day trade um, even short-term time frames couple hours after dinner, a couple hours before you go in. I don't recommend, if let's say you're a doctor, God forbid, and you're operating on somebody, then you got an hour break. Don't go into the break room and trade. You know, give your patients a break. But, you, you know, wait till, wait till you can pay full attention. But there's plenty of time before and after what you're doing. So that's a, that's a good point. Um, please go over. Peter says, hi, Peter. I've, how are you doing? Uh, please go over why we don't do shorts at the top slider. Well, the biggest problem with that is there's no stop. Because when we were taking a look at that, if, now if you could draw a down sloping median line that then uh, has been tested, then been touched, for example, Cynthia, I'm going to, I think I can do this. Let me go back one. Yeah, here we go. I can do that, right? Yes, and we're seeing it. Okay, good. Always a good thing then. Um, so 
we don't want to go naked here, but let's say we could draw. Let's say we could draw a down sloping median line. Yeah, I wish I could draw. There we go. If I could draw a down sloping median line. Well, okay, I'm doing it with arrows, but you get the idea. Um, and it was retesting. You know, that might be one thing. But just going short, naked short up here, you know, we're in outer space. There's no stop. It's a cash stop. Is it going to stop there? Well, why not sell here at the median, at the upper parallel? You would have got blown out. So you have to be very careful about choosing a top. So it's better to find a down sloping median line, even if your trade is down here. Oh, let me get my cursor. Darn it. I'm sorry, Cynthia. Even if your trade is down here instead of up here, at least you'll have a lot more information about the market. You'll be able to calcul calculate your risk reward ratio. You'll know whether or not the stop is acceptable, and you won't be guessing at the top versus selling at this area and getting stopped out just to have price stop where it's supposed to stop. So it's very difficult, even though, they, uh, yes, this is picture, picture perfect, I wouldn't encourage you to lean on these because a lot of times they'll poke through and then head lower. And, but, you know, this is, of course, unfortunately picture perfect. And I, don't, I, I, I say unfortunately because I don't want to encourage bad habits in anybody, I want you to make money. So picking tops and picking bottoms. And Barbara and I, Cynthia, you're on the exchanges as well. You know, we see people that pick tops and pick bottoms. And generally, um, they're on their way out. It's a bad thing. And you always feel bad when guys blow out. So um, let's see. Um, I'm not going to mention the trader. I do. This is Stuart, this, this, this Stuart but um, because see, I don't want to comment on anybody else. But yes, I know him. Um, Sell everything and buy gold prior to the 1979 move. Okay. And I, by the way, I traded during the Hunt Brother move and made lots and lots of money. Um, but I was lucky. I got a phone call from somebody that got a margin call um, and was able to get out of my silver position right before it became completely illiquid. So that taught me a whole lot about the value of Amos's. Um, there's a famous statement that Amos Hostetter made that you may or may not have heard, which is, take the cheese, just let me out of the trap. In other words, you can have the money I've got on the table, just give me the rest of my balance back. And the, what happens in markets that become completely illiquid like that, um, when the Hunt, Bro Hunt Brothers tried to corner the market is, at the end, you couldn't even get out of your position. And so uh, that's, w that's one of my favorite expressions. So um, yes, the markets moved exactly the same way back then as they move now. They look, if you look at a daily, if you go back and look at daily gold, or the daily Dow, or daily stocks back in those periods, or back in the 20s. Remember, Dr. Andrews invented this stuff in the 1920s. It looks exactly the same. And nowadays, we trade on real-time data. It looks the same in five minutes as it does on 240s, as it does on 15 tick charts, or it doesn't matter. Anything that fluctuates any time frame. Uh, let's see. Always good to see somebody else here from the Coral Gables group. There's only uh, nine of us left now uh, that studied under Dr. Andrews that were in his original Coral Gables group. Um, I'm lucky I was a little boy, so to speak. And um, so, you know, I, I we're watching the numbers dwindle, and I, I, I thank God every, every day that I wake up and see the sun, so to speak, because I'm at the point where I do see some of my friends disappearing. So let's see. Would you recommend to people like me that cannot trade for a living due to the lack of money but have a nice track record, maybe you can forward to some company that hires traders? I've been doing this since 16th, I'm not 20, and no luck. Well, the problem with that is there's something going on right now called a liquidity crisis. And I know several people that hire proprietary traders, but they haven't been hiring prop traders since 2008, and they're still not. Um, I got one gentleman who was an assistant of mine a job with a another you know I was a commodities corporation for a long time and I got him a job uh, from somebody that was also from commodities corporation that has a hedge fund at the moment but I'll tell you it was a lot of work to even get him in the door even though he had a nice track record it's very difficult right now other than trading your own money um, I, I would suggest you know as the, as banks start to lend more you'll see more prop rooms because there's lots of money out there it's just that people are being tight with the money so at the moment that's a very it's a very difficult place to be in, um, and I don't have any suggestions other than just keep monitoring the situation, keep uh, trading small, 
uh, keep improving your track record. You'll need at least 18 months of live track record to even walk in the door, and uh, it has to be good. Let's see. Nick says, uh, do we buy at the market uh, at the price level or use a stop buy? Well, I generally use limit buys and limit sells. And then uh, for exits, I just use limit orders uh, to get out as well. Um, if you're worried, you can use market if touched. Most brokers support that. Um, if they don't, then you're just going to have to monitor it and uh, put your limit order in. If your limit order gets hit and you don't get filled entirely, you can go to the market. That's a stylistic thing. It depends on your ability to execute. Um, let's see. Th thank you for the wish for, for my kids. I'll, I'll, I'll see you again. We'll see you soon. Could I do a live analysis of gold? Well, this is for weeklies. This was this was through two days ago, Charlie. That's about as live as it gets. When you see the market frequency changes, that if price accelerates inside the original upward sloping Andrews pitchfork, will you consider another pitchfork for trading? Sure. I'll, and you saw me draw some smaller ones inside earlier. So if you if especially if you have a wider pitchfork and price starts to accelerate, drawing a smaller one is, is always a good idea. Absolutely. But make sure it's tested before you draw it. And remember, the smaller it is and the steeper it is, the more likely price is going to trade to the right out in space and trade out of it. So you have to be careful using it, okay? Um, do I ever use hourly bar charts for analysis to base trades on? Of course. Do you ever use shorter terms less than an hour? Sure. For example, in, in uh, currencies, I'll use uh, uh, 240s for my big time frame because that's what most hedge fund guys use, including me. What, why, why is that? The 240 minutes is New York morning. 240 minutes is New York afternoon. Then there's 240 minutes for Japanese morning, 240 minutes for Japanese afternoon, 240 minutes for London, 240 minutes for London afternoon, et cetera. So it's half a day. Then the inside one is, it used to be 60 minutes. That used to be the American standard. But now that Europeans are more active, they like 20 minutes. So it's 20 minutes and 240s are the two that are most used. But I, I, I'll go to 60s. I have no problem with 60s. I use 20s. Um, sometimes they use 480s as well as 240s, dailies, weeklies. Yes, you can have a hug. I, uh, anyone in here would like a hug, you got one. So we're at 1561 low for the day and uh, at 1582 and accelerate. Well, okay. I, I want to see what it does when it gets down to the, when it gets down. I, I, I think we're going to head down. And I want to see it down in this area. And I, I hope it will poke through, come back down and give me a retest right in the energy point. That's what I'd like to see. Does the market give it to me? No, not all the time. Didn't give it to me here. I don't need a trade, and that's the way you should think about it. You can't tell the market what to do. The market will do what it's going to do. So at this point, um, I don't have anything to do in gold unless I'm long. Um, do I always look for those ABC pattern structures as part of your analysis? No, Keith, that was, um, that was just a freebie that I threw in. As I was drawing, as I was drawing the sliding parallel, my first test of the sliding parallel was beautiful down in here. Here's here's my first point, my A point. Here's my B point. Then I saw the nice test here. I'm fine with the sliding parallel when it tests here and starts to move up, and I'm ready to test on the retest. But that being said, I saw the ABC pattern here. Saw another ABC pattern here. So if you're not comfortable with sliding parallels yet, mark in the ABCs. Mark in the ABCs. Note that it terminates here and it terminates on this ABC. It should give you extra confidence on its sliding parallel. And confidence is important when you trade. That's all. Um, let's see. Do I always look for a wide range bar before entering a trade? No, not particularly, but one thing I did do. Cheers, Keith. Uh, one, thing I, one thing I do, one thing it does do for me, a wide range bar, it makes me sit up and pay attention. I'm looking for an event. I'm looking for something that says, hey, Tim, pay attention. Because, you know, o over a trading day, if you're watching the market for hours, or if you're like me, you know, I have a portfolio trade on for myself and my four investors, and I've done two or three hours of analysis beforehand, then I do a, 
a, a, a live session in market geometry for a couple hours midday. Uh, then I'm, oh, what am I going to do now this afternoon? Well, this afternoon, let me trade for a couple hours. Okay, well, I'm looking at the market. I'm a little bit tired from the midday session, a little bit tired from trading earlier on in the day. So what, what makes me pay attention? What grabs my focus? A wide range bar, maybe, or running through a if price ran through this multi-pivot line, this point of ignition area. If it ran through there, I'd sit up and pay attention. So that's what I'm looking for. As, as my partner Shane says, I'm looking for people to get hurt. I don't mean in a mean way. You're looking for the stops to get run. You're looking for uh, uh, fast price action. When is the uptrend done? At a break at a lower slope? Well, this, low, this sliding parallel is done so well. I'd be worried, first of all, if we took out this point of ignition. But second of all, if we were doing significant damage below this sliding parallel, we're in trouble. Where are we absolutely dead? I think, let me see if I can draw it. Right there. This is my last big swing. We'll be through the point of ignition. We'll be through the sliding parallel. We'll be through, oh, cursor, darn it. Let me do it again. We'll be through the sliding parallel. We'll be through the lower parallel. We'll be through the point of ignition line. And I even gave you a balance, nice little balance line right here. Look at me connect the tops, tops, bottoms, bottoms, projected out in space. If we get below this balance line, we're likely gone over the cliff. Um, Alex says, can, what's my suggestion for incorporating Andrew's pitchforks with option strategies? I would draw the physical, just like I, I talked earlier about using micro gold, draw on the big gold contract, and then trade basically on the micro gold, I would do the same thing in the options. The way to know where the market is going, draw on the physical or on the futures, then from there, devise your option strategy. Ah, Chris Baker says, okay, thank you. I, I normally don't give much publicity on the fifth grader program. What do I charge for doing a presentation for fifth graders? This is my third year. I charge nothing. I am so honored. My son's school, when we still lived in Chicago, was in this program, and it's for accelerated students only. And um, they were having a tough, a tough run. And um, they were down 38% in the first month as a group. And, you know, they, they, they want to get a little contest. They want to do well. So they asked me if I would just come and give them a lecture. And I was so honored that somebody would ask me. So I came and gave a lecture, and the kids loved it. I gave, I, you know, I never give them trade ideas, but I just give them like simple uh, money management. Um, this idea of trading off the mountain is very powerful, or on the downside, it's a valley. A very, very powerful stuff. I call it crayon drawing. In fact, we're going we're to put out a little booklet for it. And um, First year I had uh, th I had three three uh, three uh, schools. Next year I had 59 schools. This year, uh, I'm sorry. This year I have yeah. The year before I had 59 schools. This year I have over 750 schools. I don't know if it's going to be funded next year. I won't find out till the end of the year. But it's free. I just donate my time. Period. So at the end of the year, um, at the end of the school year, if you get a hold of me, if you drop me an email. Um, I'll put you on the mailing list, and if we find that, we're, that it's funded, it's not me. It's, it's, it's a group that does it for, uh, it's available to all United States schools, and they can opt in or opt out. If it's funded, um, I'll be glad to give you the information. If it's not funded, um, then we may actually, market geometry may do something. We, we've talked to the exchanges about it. We may figure out something, but thank God it was picked up this year, hopefully be picked up again next year. So, Do, do I comment on the results? Um, no, I, not to the students themselves, but teachers, for example, will send me, what they do is they filter through and they'll send me three or four charts. They don't want to inundate me. And um, they'll say, uh, this stop looks wrong to me. Did I misunderstand what you were saying? Or uh, was this entry correct? I didn't, I'm not sure. So I talk more to the teachers. I'm actually not, if you think about it, this is a litigious society. You don't want to talk to the students and the school doesn't want you to talk to the students because then you'd have an adult talking to a fifth grader that's not really you know, I don't work for a school system per se. So, and I and I don't want to have that kind of contact. And now we're at over 12,000 students. I wouldn't have time to breathe. But instead, 
you know, I get um, representative email, representative charts in the emails, and then I I comment on them, and and uh, at, hopefully at the end of the year things are going well. If you wondered last year, um, out of the top ten positions, every one of them were in my program. Um, I'm not going to put any pressure on IB to, to participate. It's it's difficult. I mean, you know, you have to get people interested, in, just like I wouldn't put present in any. Uh, any pressure on the CME. It, everybody has a lot of, listen, you can't imagine how many hours of her life Cynthia puts in to getting these presentations in front of you every day or on a regular basis, okay? Uh, you can't imagine how difficult it is because you have to get it through, you have to get it in front of the right people, you have to walk it through, it's got to go through compliance. There's lots of reasons to do things and not do things. For, for example, I recently uh, lectured at MIT and I was the first person to lecture at the MIT uh, they have a trading lab now at the Sloan Business School. I was the first person that was willing to lecture there. They had trouble getting people to lecture. Why would you not want to lecture at MIT? Well, you might get sued. You might say the wrong thing. You may don't. Maybe you don't want to give up for, for proprietary secrets. I don't know. But even they had trouble. So you know, it doesn't know. All right. So <clears throat> that's enough. So. Well, Tim, I'm going to jump in here because I think we could go all day long with yeah, all yeah. of these questions, and I do so appreciate your time, as Thank I know all of our participants do. But what I'd also like to do is announce now, because we've been talking with Tim over the last month, and we're looking forward to having Tim come back for a regular monthly webinar. So, um, Yay. Yes, and it Thank will you, be darling. presented on the second Thursday of each month, so we're even narrowing it down. Um, it takes me a few minutes, as Tim said, it takes me a little time to get the topics posted out to our website, but please do check back monthly on the um, uh, IB website underneath education. There's a webinars link that will give you access, and all of these events will be included under the industry-sponsored um, section. So please uh, take a look there. You can actually look at some of our previously recorded sessions with Tim. Always great material. Um, but sounds like we're going to have to. We've gone quite a dis or quite a ways here today, and I'm I sorry. have to thank. Oh no, thank you, Tim. Thank you for spending that extra time and uh, graciously answering all of these questions. It looks like um, you have an idea of what's in store for you next month as well. Um, yes, but that I I'm, is I'm already building those slides for you, darling. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> so everyone here today, I also want to remind you, we've recorded today's event. Now, that recording as well as Tim's slides will be posted to our website. Um, usually within a couple of hours after the webinar ends, but also just as soon as they become available, by simply registering for any of these events, you'll be on the list to receive that, record, that link to the recorded playback as well as a copy of the slides. Now, as I mentioned, um, the slides, as you leave today's event, you'll find that the slides will pop up in a PDF format as a drop-off link once you close this session down. So they are available for you. You can print them or simply save them and come back and refer to them as you're going through any of our recorded information. So great deal of thanks to um, <clears throat> both, well, I need to bring Barbara and the CME and thank the CME for making today's um, event possible. It's their dedication to educational material that's um, connected, uh, Tim, with interactive brokers. So I have to thank everyone, and especially Tim Morge, for um, spending so much time with us here today. Thank you, Tim. And we're looking forward to uh, hooking up with you again next month. So um, <clears throat> do want to let you know that you can exit today's event by simply using the X in the upper right-hand corner, and then watch for that playback later on this afternoon. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. And do remember, as Tim would say, as well, trade smart. Thanks, all. Thanks. Take care, Cynthia. I appreciate okay. it, Barbara. Uh Looking forward to next month, Tim. Thank you. All right. I'll, I'll get them to you so you won't have to sweat at all. All of you, thank you for taking the time. I know I went long, but hopefully it was interesting. Take care. Okay. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much.